So I'll talk for 20 to, I don't know, 25 minutes, uh, if that. And, um, and then I'd really love to open up to a broader conversation about this. Um, this is, you know, this is a topic that I would say is, um, it's something that weighs on me a lot. And, um, and so it's a, it's a pretty big topic. So I try to, I try to make it as digestible as I could uh, and using mostly my own experience um, as, uh, as the guide for that. And, um, and so, yeah, I would, I would also be interested to know if anybody knows of any terminologies or systems that I'm not aware of that, uh, that could help us all clarify this quest for originality. Uh, I know, you know, for instance, Nick has, has familiarism um, as his particular uh, way of, of seeking that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to launch into the presentation, I guess. So uh, let's see, can you guys see the presentation? Cool. Okay, and hopefully there's no typos, but I'm a designer, so cut me a break. Um, so here, the pursuit of originality. Um, so what does that mean to me exactly uh, to start out with? Um, I think it means projects that are unexpected and delightful. That's, that's my personal way of viewing originality, um, or at least what I would consider, um, you know, the highest watermark of originality. Obviously, delightful does not factor into originality across the board, but that's just kind of a metric for me. Um, and so what is, you know, where can that come? Where can that manifest? You've got forms, markets, color material finish, packaging, UX, storytelling, visualization. All of these things can be uh, areas in which you pursue some sort of originality. I mean, to, to cover all of these bases in one project is extraordinarily ambitious. And so, you know, maybe it's not all in one project. Maybe, maybe not everything has to be original. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's very rare that you get the opportunity to do something truly original across the board. Um, and you probably need billions of dollars of corporate funding in order to do so. But who knows, maybe you just need passion behind an Instagram project. Um, why do I think it's important? I think original ideas are psychologically fulfilling. Um, I think there's a lot of fulfillment when we see things that are original. Um, I'm not quite sure what that, what that term would actually be psychologically. You know, I think um, I think oftentimes the world feels pretty chaotic, and when people can put synthesize information into a palatable, delightful form, it's very psychologically fulfilling. Um, and you know, on the other side of that, I think it's very psychologically fulfilling. For instance, when a brand takes something that's a stale pro product and gives it new life, that you know, it's sort of that novelty, but it's it's fulfilling for people to to see that transformation that a company can can take something that's old and stale and give it new life so you know you can push the needle forward on design either the design itself or or maybe even um on a brand level um but i i think that what's important about seeking originality is that ambition begets ambition um, I think the ambition to create original ideas, unique ideas, it encourages other people to do the same. Um, I think it's a very high risk, high reward kind of scenario when you're trying to do original things. Um, and so it can be very frustrating, um, but it also can be extraordinarily rewarding in the end. Um, and I think it's always good to remember, and this was something that I was exposed to in college, nothing is truly original. You know, originality is the synthesis, synthesization, is that a word? Synthesizing, 
ideas into a resolved form. Uh, and to me, that happens through these kind of equations and these filters. Um, and maybe there's some other categories here, and that's what I would love to explore in more of the conversational side of this um, presentation. So let's uh, move forward. So equations. Uh, what do I mean by equations? Well, they can be as rudimentary as, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You've got teenage, teenagers, you've got ninjas, you've got turtles. And they have to be mutants, of course, because how else would you get teenage ninjas uh, as turtles? So, uh, you know, that's, that's a kind of equation. Um, and it's, you know, it's totally unexpected, but really, like I saw a bunch of people smile at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle analogy. It, it is like, it's fun, it's funny, but you know, they also created a great story, like great storytelling and adventures behind these things. So we all kind of know and love them. Uh, and then there's Star Wars. Um, Star Wars is a really interesting case study um, because there are, just so many things that are packed into Star Wars. Um, but kind of if you break down the Jedi, it's, it's like a Buddhist samurai cowboy in space. And, you know, George Lucas was pulling from, you know, Eastern religions. He was pulling from the history of cinema. He was, and, but he was also pushing forward technologies that hadn't really been explored yet um, a lot within, uh, within cinema. You know, there were a lot of special effects that were innovated within this process. And so that's where you get the culmination of something like the Jedi um, because of the abilities of special effects. Um, and then if we were going to go to the product level, you know, this is this is one of my like one of my favorite products. I remember when I saw it in the store it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to Joseph Joseph. And uh, I just thought that this was like, it was just so much fun to play with for one, but I just loved the mechanism. And I don't know if I un knew at the time, but essentially the spaghetti measure that Joseph Joseph did was the standard, you know, the standard idea of measuring out portions of spaghetti plus a camera aperture. You know, it's, it's this very simple equation and you just immediately get it, but also it's just delightful to interact with. Um, and then there are uh, filters. So moving on to filters. Um, some of you may know, I did this project with Reed Schlegel a while ago, but this was something that we learned in school where these form families, and so you had these four form families, and the idea is to take a product and pass it through the filter of these form families. Um, I mean, you can sort of think about a filter you know, we deal with filters all the time as we are mostly probably all on Instagram and we use filters to, um, you know, take a, take a picture and give it a certain feeling, a certain mood, um, or to clarify the image. And so, you know, this is a case where you're passing through this watering can through these form families and these were sort of the final ideas that I had arrived at. But of course it was a large exploration, um, but it was just a way to find unique forms and solutions through um, this particular filter. Um, and so if I go into a more you know, universal example of Apple, of course, people are always making this comparison to Dita Rams. Um, I mean, really it's, it's about sort of modernist principles um, so you're taking, like, I don't know if you guys remember the Walkman and like the CD Walkman from Sony in the 90s, but just completely different. I, I call that era kind of 90s futurism, whereas this is just very strict modernist principles, but something that is kind of in that 90s uh, uh, filter mode, I would say, it, were, were the IMAX. And I would say that this is actually the product that got me super interested in Apple as a company. I remember like going to Micro Center when I was, mm, which is, you know, kind of a computer store. And I think I was like 12, I would ask to be dropped off there and I would just wander around the Apple section, just like looking at all the product because it just, I mean, it was literal eye candy. And I mean, it was, that was kind of part of it was this eye candy thing. 
and breaking away from this typical beige com computers that we had seen up until that point. Um, I just read this in an article, so I'm wondering if it's actually true, but I think it's an interesting story, which is um, that Johnny Ive said about the iMac, what computer would the Jetsons have had? And so I have this little clipping from the Jetsons. It's funny because there is sort of this overlapping form that, that seems to emerge there. It is sort of this retrofuturism. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, to kind of go on a tangent, I think there's a lot of value in retrofuturism um, because it's kind of, it's giving you this, friendly, it's extending a friendly hand into the future, essentially. Um, and so here's, here's sort of the filter. You have the, the beige computer and you filter it through the Jetsons. You combine components and you get the iMac. Um, and, uh, and so this next example is actually kind of a combination. So you've got the equation. So we all know OXO. Maybe, maybe we don't all know this story, but the OXO story is, is that Sam, I think it's Sam Farber, the founder of OXO, um, he was watching his, his uh, I think he, he was in his old age, he was watching his elderly wife try to peel potatoes and just having such a hard time with sort of the typical peeler at that time. It was this all metal, not very ergonomic, not very comfortable type of potato peeler. And so I think the story is, is that they actually stuck a bike handle onto the peeler. And so that, that was sort of this, um, this moment where there was this synthesis of, oh, like, you know, this is, this is actually really good. Of course, you can't just stick a bike handle onto a metal potato peeler and sell it at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. And so they took it to a design firm, Smart Design, who created the OXO products. But once you've established that, once you've established this form language, um, then it's about this, this brand language filter. So you can pretty much take every single kitchen utensil or you know, everything that OXO touches and pass it through this filter of usability and ergonomics. Um, and create a whole new market essentially um, and, and sort of change the market forever. Um, this may seem easy, but it's not. And I, this, this next example is, is especially, it, it's gonna be funny for the senior, more senior level designers or older designers out there. Um, but for the students, uh, this is a cautionary tale, but it's also, probably something that you're going to end up doing in your design career. Um, and that is to be too ambitious uh, and, and, or not to put your ambition in the right place. So when I was working at Lifetime Brands, I was tasked with taking this, this um, can opener by this, for this brand Rio and subtract plastic from it. So essentially make it into more of a typical can opener. And as you can see, I was trying to retain some of the language in here. And when I went to present it to the head of um, the kitchenwares division, this was this is what I presented, uh, and I felt I felt okay about it. Uh, and he said, "That's the ugliest can opener I've ever seen." And that was, you know, from the head of housewares at Lifetime Brands. That was a kick in the teeth, of course. So. Um, you know, so I went back to the drawing board and, uh, you know, I realized that the ideas there were not properly synthesized. Um, and I think I was trying to be too original um, with, with this. I, I was trying to not only reference the prior design, but also bring in my own flair into it. And it just was, was a tremendous failure. And so I ended up going back to the drawing board and actually taking inspiration from the Rio knife handle and bringing that in to make a much cleaner aesthetic. And in the end, something that is much more successful. And I would say at the same time, you know, 
I think it does achieve a certain sense of originality because of using the original brand language that Rio had established at that point. Fast forward, um, you know, I go to Peloton and they ask me to design dumbbells and these are the resulting dumbbells. And, you know, for anybody who watches or listens to the podcast, what, you know, is on my Instagram, you've probably seen this story before, but anyway, I think it's a really good example of, of sort of the equation type mindset of taking what are dumbbells that I would consider intimidating. I am not somebody who's a gym rat in the slightest. And to walk into a gym full of equipment is, is not my idea of a good time. And I just, there's nothing about the aesthetic that welcomes a user in, extends that hand. Um, and so, you know, the other part of this equation is that Peloton is an at-home fitness company, so you're not going to the gym. So we can reimagine all of these things as they would fit into the home and into the home ecosystem. And so you take the pillow, which, you know, for a while I was trying to figure out the right thing, the right equation for this, and looking through mostly interiors for interiors, uh, uh, chairs, couches, you know, whatever, home interior products, uh, and trying to find something that made sense with the dumbbell. And so, you know, that I remember it was actually just looking at the Eames lounge chair, looking at that specific detail where I kind of made the realization um, uh, of this form, I, I feel like the form is mostly successful because of the button, which is, you know, you need a place to put the weight, the weight number onto. And so this button where the form starts to, to fold in on itself and it gives it this really friendly, inviting aesthetic. And also the square form that you would get from the pillow um, I mean, it's sort of your typical rounded square that you see in a lot of products, but there's a good reason for it, which is um, stability during floor exercises, uh, where again, you have people just coming to fitness for the first time, and you don't want somebody on a hex weight accidentally rolling, rolling the weight while they're doing floor exercises like push-up rows and uh, twisting the wrist. And that resulted in this, which was, you know, a triumph compared to the can opener, which uh, I actually just happened to, like, this was miraculous. I, I was a freelancer at Peloton, and I walked into the meeting at the time that the CEO said, those are the most beautiful dumbbells I've ever seen. Like, that was, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my timing. Um, but. Uh, but it was just really rewarding. But it was because of this process of really thinking about, okay, like of course I could, I could take these dumbbells and pump it through the lemonouche filter, but instead I want to try and find something, something else, something else that nobody else is maybe thinking of and looking for. And I mean, luckily Peloton is the type of company that would give me a lot, me the time to do that. Um, and they were behind me as I told my design manager, I want to make a dumbbell that looks like a pillow. So, you know, th these are fortunate, uh, things that happen, but, um, you know, you got to rise to the challenge and you have to be ready for the challenge when it happens. Um, and so, you know, one thing is if you think you're not getting good product projects, always be on the lookout for opportunities and ask for these opportunities. And these are, these are opportunities where you can show, hey, I can come up with novel, original, good ideas. Um, in this case, this was this set of KitchenAid self-leveling measuring spoons that I designed in my first year Lifetime brand. So this was right after college. And um, I saw that people were working on this project and I sort of, 
asked if I could contribute. Um, and I think, I, I think I was between projects at the time. And so my manager was like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll give you a day on this. And so, um, I was looking at some of the competition. I think this is how it went. Of course, this is like seven years ago. So details are hazy, but there's actually this, this, the, there's this set of measuring spoons and then there's a couple others that have this pin in the back and sort of this rotating thing for the spoons. Um, but of course, you know, if you were to fill that second spoon in, in, the, in the green Chefin spoon there, you would kind of be able to level. But the problem is you have nothing to level the top one with other than your finger or with a knife. So by taking that, flipping it, flipping and getting a mirror image to be able to swipe across all of them, um, you're then able to level everything. And uh, that actually got me a utility patent, which was, which was great. Um, and something that Lifetime Brands was, you know, when they saw the idea, they immediately pushed for and, and got, got the utility patent for me and for the company. And that was, that was awesome. Um, but you know, if you're not getting those projects and if you're looking for something to do, and I know that this is kind of like, I feel like I've given this advice so many times and I feel like you could probably get some eye rolls here, but in the meantime, you know, practice your originality through Instagram and design competitions, find those opportunities. If you feel like you're not getting the opportunity to pursue these types of ideas, if these are the types of ideas that you want to pursue, then that make those projects for yourself. And, you know, one, one last time, the helicopter project, you know, I kind of gave myself this, this set of criteria which was I was going to attempt to redesign one archetype, the toy helicopter, through a modern filter using three materials, sketch to render in one day, and create as many helicopters as I could. 21 happened to be the number. And so, you know, I took the standard helicopter and I filtered it through sort of modern design trends because at that time it was kind of an OXO thing. It's like, you look at toy helicopters and they are either oddly sort of traditional wooden toys that have these strange forms or you have these sort of hyper real um, toy helicopters. And so it, this was sort of that middle ground th that I wanted to pursue. And because nobody has yet to pay, like pay me to design toys, this was my chance, this was my opportunity. And so, you know, for, for students and graduating seniors, um, creating good and original designs in a professional setting will take time. Um, you're gonna have to get better at understanding um, manufacturing as well as office politics um, before you can get there in some instances. I mean, some of you will get opportunities where, you will be in the right place at the right time to get the kind of mentorship and, and, and to get people to push you to pursue things that are original and worthwhile. But sometimes, like m one of my first projects at Lifetime Brands was designing, um, was designing chip clips for Guy Fieri and and they looked like this, and uh, it was it was something that I was not really all that about. And luckily, they never went to production. But don't I, I would say that if you feel like you're not doing the work that you want to be doing, at least you can learn learn the lessons of manufacturing and of the office on the road to that. And you know, one other thing is. Uh, I really, I do like this quote a lot because I think it speaks to times where we might get overly ambitious, like with the can opener project. And Paul Rand said, don't try to be original, just try to be good. Um, I think sometimes we can put too much pressure on ourselves to be so original right out of the gate. And you really need to start with the building blocks, start with 
as as architects would call i'm i'm pretty sure this is the terminology they use they would call it the plan so what is what's what is the plan what it what what is the organization of spaces and then on top of that you apply your originality um and uh and so yeah i think it's important to know that for every original design you've seen there's often a long fought battle behind it um and so that's that is the the talk so far that is uh that's sort of the end of the presentation but i really want to open it up to conversation um because i hope that it sparks some questions or ideas that we can discuss So, uh, yeah, anybody can. Uh, Hi, James. Oh. Yeah. What's up, Matt? Hey, um, thanks for taking the time to give us this talk. Uh, but when you go through this filtering process or this equation sort of uh, example, do you seek a novel? influences by like creating mood boards or just taking observations mm. from your life or like what does that process look like for you um i would say that it looks like a very messy process um i you know when it came to the dumbbells i it was i i think i created you know like seven or eight different mood boards uh and inspiration boards and just kind of you know, and that wasn't all at once. That was like, uh, like day after day, I was sort of like reconsidering how I was putting together the inspiration and what I was trying to draw inspiration from. And, and of course, creating concepts out of that. And, um, and so I think eventually it was just a matter of staring at those mood boards and staring at that detail for long enough that it just like kind of clicked. Mm. But I will say that it one thing about it is that it's never it's never just sitting and looking at something that will spark that idea. I think it is a matter of constantly moving forward. And I was creating a lot of models at the time of the ideas that I was coming up with. And I think that feedback between the sketches and the models and the mood boards was really important for discovering um that final form um yeah great is is that does that answer the question yeah cool i had a question um hey, Ryan. I'm, I'm curious uh how you would in your experience weigh the um kind of the balance between maybe a, your client or employers sort of predisposition towards wanting to achieve originality and innovation versus like your skills that you've built up over time for like pushing for it um, yourself. Hmm. Hmm. Wait, so, so are you asking, so the client is asking for something original is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, do you feel do you feel like that has been a lynch like kind of a linchpin for your ability to execute like this or um Oh, I see. Multiple so clients. so is it is it is it the is it the fortunate occurrence of having a good client that allows you to push towards original work? Um I think it's definitely a benefit. It's it's definitely a huge benefit. Um, I would say that I feel somewhat fortunate in my career that I have yet to encounter a client whose ambitions didn't maybe exceed mine in some ways, or, or maybe their expectations sort of, I, I mean, I've worked for so many startups and startups are just full of ambition. Um, and so, but I would say that lifetime brands it's amazing to me how many like with lifetime brands as being a, as big a corporation as they were they didn't really seem to want to 
disrupt the designers that much. Like that, that example of the, the, the guy telling me that my can opener was hideous. I mean, he, he was right. You know, that's, that's one thing, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it was kind of amazing to me how much they kind of let, let us, um, you know, let us be free to, to work as long as we were working within the parameters of like a, a decent timeline, a decent product timeline. Um, but of course they wouldn't necessarily with every project be like, we want to achieve something that we could get a patent for. And, and so maybe you would pursue something down that route and, and that would actually be, you know, that would be a win for them. Um, but, um, you know, that's kind of why I say that I think originality, if you're, you're trying to strive for it and maybe you can't get it in all of the facets, maybe you can get it in one or two of them. Um, but I'm curious, Ryan, if you've had encounters with clients where you felt like you didn't have the runway to be, to be original and how you dealt with that. To a degree um, over time, I don't have as much varied experience as you do, I, I don't think, but uh, actually working for a company for a long time, I experienced different periods of time within which, uh, you know, people came and went from the company while I was still there uh, quite, quite a lot. And uh, under different leadership, there were vastly different appetites for and hunger sort of for uh, innovation or, or spending money in ways that would, um, you know, place a bet on originality, bringing in a return. Yeah. Yeah. One, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, what you think about the, like how many designers did you work with when you, when you're at this company? At the peak, I think there were uh, three others. So okay. Pretty small. Yeah. So Lifetime Brands was 30 designers, <laughs> which was kind of absurd. But one thing that it did, which I really cherish to this day, was that there were enough of us there that were, there were, of course, very jaded designers who were just kind of like, oh, just that's good enough. Let's just, let's move on. But there were plenty of other designers there who were like, we can we can do much better than this. Like, let's let's do like something awesome, you know. And so and and, you know, that's interesting that you bring up people because people is a huge component of this. And if you can get. If you can get enough sort of. Of inertia behind you with the people who are around you and and, and maybe you yourself are pushing like, hey, guys, like we can make really awesome stuff if we, if we just like really push this and we really get behind each other. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if that could be an antidote to a situation where things are just, it's okay, that's good enough. Let's move on. Um, but I, you know, that might be difficult under circum certain circumstances. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think that think there's a whole topic for conversation there. Um, I had a quick question kind of jumping off of that, James. Yeah. Um, I was curious if you've been personally, if you have an example of a situation in which you have wanted to like bring forward a more original idea, um, but like you've had pushback from like leadership, but then on top of that, I know you always talk about kind of bringing fun into the design, right? And like not just designing things for like the function of them, but also like the joy they bring people. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe you've had an example of that as well or like the same or both of them together or something like that yeah yeah that's interesting because it's definitely that is something that I've been thinking about recently especially when it comes to storytelling um, and something that I wanted to include excuse me in this talk but really couldn't figure out how to include it is compelling storytelling because I I do think that when it comes to the workplace, like nobody wants to sit through another, like, you know, boring, dull, aggravating meeting, you know, people, 
people enjoy levity, people enjoy good storytelling. And it's something that I've really been trying to focus on in my career because I think that there are battles that I've lost because I didn't seem I didn't seem passionate enough about the idea or I really wasn't passionate about the idea and and um and so it didn't it didn't end up going through um you know it's I think it's hard to show up to work every day sometimes and be enthusiastic about that work um you know not all of us are are going to be you know there were times at, especially at lifetime brands where I felt completely defeated and just that I was just like cl clocking in clocking out and so it was really important for me to find opportunity for myself there but um but yeah I mean there was a case at um at Peloton with a, a product product that I was working on that I was really like I loved this product like I loved the way that it looked I thought it was um, a huge step forward for the, the category. And it got completely just annihilated because I, I, think, I think the reasons were kind of bogus. And I think it might have had to do with the limitations at that time in terms of the manufacturers that we had accessible. But at the time, you, you know, you're working at a, at a startup and the everything is is like kind of on um i don't know if need to know basis is the right term but it's like you don't necessarily have the information until it's sometimes too late like you've gone through the entire project and they're like oh by the way we don't have a vendor who can do this in any sort of way that's affordable there was also qu questions that were brought up in regards to the safety of the product and that were just it was just conjecture it was nothing else but conjecture and I really didn't see it coming I don't even think I was in the meeting when it was brought up but as soon as somebody brought up this idea that it was not going to be safe it like all of the air in that idea completely deflated and so you know mm -hmm. I do think you know I think there is something to uh, especially to the presentation, the storytelling, the enthusiasm you bring to the idea, that enthusiasm is going to be infectious. And like, if you're just going through a presentation, like, uh, next slide, and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, like we've all sat through, like for students especially, you've sat through student presentations where you're like, come on. Like you're wasting our time. Like this is, it's frustrating. And what, so why would you want to do that? <laughs> Especially do not do that to the room of people who have the money that are going to fund your project. So, <laughs> I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's, you know, th these are, these are probably things that you're going to experience because you're not going to be enthusiastic about everything. And like I said, you're not going to be able to bring your unique original to every project, but, um, you know, find, find the silver lining if you can. So. I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you have um, a template sort of for talking to people that you kind of want to work with. Like um, some designers have said that they have like, each paragraph that they write has like a certain thing and they send like X amount of like photographs about their ideas. Like what's sort of your tactic for trying to get on board with a project? So I, I see. So, so are you talking about from a consultancy's perspective? Like how do they, how do they get work from clients or is it about getting getting on to a certain project. Um, could you clarify a little bit? Yeah, I mean, like, how do you, like, from a consultancy standpoint or from, like, an individual standpoint, um, like, you were talking about some projects that, like, you got on to because you contacted the company and um, mm. offered your expertise. I see. So, um, 
Yeah, I, so when, when I was talking about the projects that I got on, those were specifically to do with when I was working at Lifetime Brands. So yes. I was already within the organization. And, um, and so they, so yeah, so I was just kind of like lurking around people asking to be a part of things. Um, and I wouldn't recommend that in real life. Uh, if, uh, but I think, um, you know, if, if it's about, if, if the real root of the question, so is the real root of the question that like, how do you get on the types of projects that you want to be a part of, regardless of whether you're employed by a company or your consultancy? Um, I think, I think you need to build up a body of work and you need to also build up a network that will allow you to be seen as somebody who um, people respect the work of, but people also enjoy working with. And if you can build that reputation, then you know that's that is the reputation that has allowed me to work with companies like Peloton and um, you know Bark and Control Labs. These these companies that are doing really interesting things and and really engaging things. And that's that in large part that's been first established through um, the the work, and then the work from the work to the reputation. Um, and so it's just a case of, you know, in some cases I, um, I would just see people out at events and, and say like, you know, if I was introduced to them, uh, and they worked at a company and they were high up at a company, I'd just be like, Hey, if you are ever looking for a freelancer, let me know. Yeah. You know, I, I, un unfortunately right now during this time, it's hard to get to networking events. Um, but, uh. I think it's always good to just, you know, throw your hat, throw your hat in the ring, you know, when, when you see, when you see an opening and, um, are you a student or a graduating student? I'm a student. I cool. have one year left. <laughs> What's that? Oh, one year left. Cool. Yeah, one year left. Um, so, you know, I would say that, if you are looking for particular types of opportunities, if you can find people working within those fields right now that you admire their work or whatever, you know, reach out to them, start reaching out to those people. You know, maybe you're already doing it, but I, I can't recommend enough just like sending compliments on Instagram yeah. or whatever. <laughs> it, can, it can open a lot of doors. So, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, James. Uh, I have a question. So yeah. kind of to, to kind of to add on to what you said, where uh, nowadays in the professional world, what people call is networking. Do you think building relations is kind of more important than just networking, where you kind of approach someone not to just get something back in return, where you just kind of yeah. just in order to have a conversation or in order to know something about the other person. I mean, that's how you build relations and have empathy. and that's how the person kind of gets that inertia, what you talked about, that trust, okay, that this person is not contacting me because he wants something from me. It's like just for a casual conversation, maybe it doesn't have to be like mean anything actually, not to yeah. get something in return, like a selfless kind of a thing. And I think, yeah, this is where I think with the relations part with the client also comes in contact where nowadays people always see clients as some devils, you know, like someone who's just behind their eyes asking them to do something but it's like we need to see them as collaborators because they are also kind of giving us an opportunity and trusting us with something they have and it's their image on the line at the same time so uh, i think this point of like getting a selfless feedback or just without any purpose is something that we can work upon as de as designers I would say. yeah no i i think i think that's a really good point um i think that relationships good relationships uh, always begin where you're not asking you're not asking for a job you're not asking for more than just a conversation more than just you know i think um i think nick and i talked about this on the podcast once but i've i've always been of the mindset that you should start the relationship because you're 
enthusiastic about wanting to start that relationship and start that conversation rather than you're in desperate need of a job. And so, but that's really hard when you're in desperate need of a job. And so, you know, sometimes it is just sort of a waiting game. Um, but, you know, maybe there is some sort of, maybe there is some sort of good tact there where, you know, the, the first conversation, I mean, I've had plenty of conversations where the conversation starts out as just polite conversation. Hey, like really love your work, blah, blah, blah. But then it will like through the course of the conversation, you will get the opportunity to say like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm working on my portfolio. I'm, I'm trying to do this, like, you know, but you just don't want to jump right out of the gate with like, Hey, I'm looking for this opportunity. Um, and you know, I will say that I'm kind of learning these lessons again myself as I've moved to a new city and I'm trying to make new connections, especially right now, because I can't say, Hey, let's go grab a coffee. Like I love your work. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. Start the relationship before you really need something, start the relationship because it's, it's a, authentically a relationship you want to have. So, and, and to your point about clients, I, yeah, I, um, I, I hope at no point during this conversation did I demonize the client because I think we, we shouldn't see them as, uh, the enemy at the gate. We should, uh, we should really, you know, form those authentic relationships with them, you know, form, form those bonds of trust, uh, if we can, so that you know, they'll be enthusiastic about the work. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just always so intrigued about what, what the clients, what the clients day to day is, because I think we don't get enough exposure when we're in school and, and, and even right out of school as to like how an organization actually functions and you know my my wife works in public relations and i had no idea what that was all about she works in in biopharma biotech public relations and you know it's amazing to me that i really didn't understand that job until we got together but now i understand how crucial that job is and so i think if we can have empathy towards the client to know that like, hey, especially with a client, if you, and if you're dealing with CEOs or people who are high up, like, you know, their their reputation within the organization, their reputation within the the larger ecosystem of organizations, you know, the, uh, is is sort of dependent on them bringing in good work and uh, good work from good people and talented people. And so there's a lot on the line for them. And I don't think that that should be taken for granted. Hi, James. So. Yeah. I wanted to highlight that thing you said about that nothing is truly original because these days I, I got the impression through, through all the, the, the amount of information we get in, in the social networks that if you don't get that, extremely original idea you are not doing anything and i don't know i think we have to pursue originality in the small things that and that will bring us to to a point in which the big picture will be original but i don't know it, it gets really intimidating to to get that kind of message through through all these social networks and and, and things like that yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I think, yeah, originality. I mean, it's a really, it's just a really tough subject. And I think that it is, it's important. It's important to kind of remove the mysticism around originality. Um, because to me, 
there's this other part of originality that maybe I didn't touch on. Um, obviously, we're all we're all originals. Like we're we're all, all original people that have had original experiences through growing up, and we were also all once consumers at one point. And so, what excited what excited you about being a consumer? You know, what excited you when, like, what was that product that excited you? I mean, I kind of gave the example of the iMac. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's important to remember those things, but to also break them down and say like, okay, here are the components that made them what they were, that made them as original as they were. You know, sometimes I find that with design, with so much of design, it's about taking very complex systems and making them digestible. And so the originality could just be that, that just that little touch of something to, you know, maybe it's just a matter of the presentation of an idea that's already there, that they already have, that a client already has. Like sometimes not more design work is needed but just like, hey, listen, like I, I feel like I've I've told clients before, like you have a really cool product, you just haven't presented it in the right way. You're just or or there's something missing, but you don't need like you don't need any design work on top of this. It's just missing this one piece that makes people aware of how original, how wonderful, how delightful this product is. Um, and so, you know, that's why I say that it's not always, it's not always going to be you're, you're working towards original design. And, um, you know, I love to see a lot of the work on Instagram where, you know, maybe the forms aren't, aren't so ambitious, but the presentation is gorgeous, you know, that, that can't be taken for granted. And, it makes you it makes you think about something in a completely different way. It gives value to something to something that you wouldn't necessarily think had value. So, anyway. Hey, uh, I have a question. Yeah. How would you would you describe the process of finding originality uh, as a designer, especially today that we are flooded with content online uh, from all around the world. So how would you describe a designer's path to finding an original voice? And how yeah. do you know you have achieved it? <laughs> that's, that's why this talk is the pursuit of originality and not the accomplishment of originality. So um, yeah, I think I'm, I think that is something that I'm constantly trying to figure out and I think I think there is a point at which for some people for some designers it's important to step away from Lemonouche and Pinterest and and all of these things and to you know like the with the Peloton example it was oh I I'm not looking for cool forms I'm looking for forms that resonate I'm looking for ideas that will hopefully resonate with the user. And so, you know, maybe you could find that by, by trying to create cool forms and there's nothing wrong with like trying to, trying to do that to uh, attempt to make something just cool. But um, for me with Peloton and thinking about the user, it was this concern with like, I'm going to be adding this thing into their home, into like their sanctuary. And I don't want it to look like some gym bullshit. I, I want it to, I want it to blend in, in a way. I want it to find its home there. And, um, so I think that it's, it can be really important to get outside of those bubbles of the, of the visual bubbles and start to start to push yourself 
to maybe find analogies, to find, to find words that are inspirational, to find ideas, like sentences that are inspirational. I know that, um, Hector, I think Advanced Design, you guys had that app that was for bringing up words that could be inspirational to, to sort of filter designs through. And I think that's, that is a really, a really great method of finding forms and, and unique ideas that you might not otherwise if you were just looking at mood boards all the time or, or inspiration boards. I will say, I think mood boards are probably more effective in the long run than inspiration boards, uh, just in sort of getting you to a certain place, um, uh, a certain mindset. And um, yeah, so I think if, if there are ways outside of imagery that you can provoke yourself that are meaningful to you, um, then I would do that. Like, what is, you know, what is the art, the art that's meaningful to you? What's the cinema that's meaningful to you? What's the music that's meaningful to you? How, how does that provoke you? And, and how could you use some of those ideas to provoke new, new designs, new work? Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, I think that's, that's my answer. James, whenever you say um, mood board versus inspiration board, um, are you referring to like the difference between um, like specific like product details versus like products overall? Or can you clarify that? Yeah, I think um, so. So an so uh, an inspiration board, uh, like you could be. I think it would be forms and details and products. Uh, mood boards are more about about feeling it's it's probably more a little bit more about emotion and um you know there's something that i picked up when i was at lifetime brands from my manager that i still use a lot in my in my practice and this is this is uh i i have found a tool that's really good in regards to designing for brands and understanding what's appropriate for a brand but um uh it, they're the Jungian archetypes. So um, Carl Jung, famous psychologist. And so sort of, I think there's 12 archetypes. And so um, you can sort of place companies within these archetypes. And so for instance, there's the magician archetype. So these are characters and themes that, that come up through throughout history, throughout literature, throughout all of these things. And so say there's the magician archetype. Um, and and so like apple fits into that category and so like if i'm at apple i'm thinking about like how do i create magic moments like how do i create uh like that that is that's the brand that's like the the filter through which the brand goes through or the products go through is like how do i how do i create magic moments and you know, that's, that's not the same for every brand. Um, you know, I think there's the creator archetype. So that would be like Legos and Minecraft. And that's all about like, okay, how do I create a tool that's going to unlock more capability for the user um, and, and unlock their creativity? And so um, I, ha I have found it very useful, uh, especially when Nick and I were at Control Labs and we were trying to like build this brand from nothing, um, from scratch. And so it was, it was this, it was like a benchmark of like, does this feel like it fits the archetype of the brand? Um, uh, and, and if not, why not? How can we, how can we achieve that? Uh, I have a question. Uh, it's about uh, the you mentioned something about making eight mood boards for like for the same kind of same goal, and we usually just like make one and try to adjust everything to it. So I'm I'm a bit interested if you can clarify how did this like go? How did you change from one mood mood board to another? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it was actually to clarify it was a combination of mood boards and and inspiration boards. Um, but I think I, I think I was just like 
with each attempt, I was not satisfied with what I had put together in that it wasn't, I guess it wasn't provoking anything satisfactory to me. And, um, and so I was just constantly, like while I was iterating on the design, I was iterating on the mood boards. And some of them might have had similar elements to them, but um, I, you know, this was also, I was, this was four years ago, I think. And so it was also just a matter of like, I really didn't have good experience with mood boards and inspiration boards from school. And so it was also kind of a learning process for me and something that we hadn't really done at Lifetime Brands because we were working with established brands. And so there were established brand languages. And when it came to Peloton, it was kind of a newer company. And so that brand language was being established. And so it was necessary for me to go through multiple rounds where I could explore mood and inspiration. Um, and uh, I think also I'm just somebody that ends up doing too much work in one direction and, and probably should know when to quit on certain aspects of the design. But um, I think another thing that I sort of mentioned about originality is like this want and desire for things to just fall out of your head uh, and be original and unique. And I think because that wasn't happening for me during that project. I was in this mode of like, I'm doing this wrong. I need to make another mood board. This isn't the right mood board. It could also have just been just sheer panic <laughs> as a young freelancer. Hi, James. Thank you. Hey, Miranda. Um, going back to relationship building and networking, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about mentorship, like within mm. design. Yeah, uh, this is this is an interesting one because I I feel like in some ways I've had no mentors, in some ways I've had tons of mentors. Like I and and while I'm saying mentor, I feel like I'm saying centaur. But anyway, uh, but the the thing about mentors is is sometimes you don't you don't maybe recognize them as mentors at the time because they're you haven't declared them, you haven't you haven't knighted them with the title of mentor, but you know, there's, there's so many things that I've learned from so many different people, but um, there are definitely people that, that especially now I, I have consistent conversations with, I would say they're more peers than mentors. Um, and I do think that, I do, I do think that at a, at a bare level, conversation is so important to progressing as a designer and conversation with other designers. Um, you know, I really value uh, like doing the podcast with Nick because it's a chance for us to have conversations all the time to work through our ideas. Um, but when it comes to mentors, it's interesting because recently somebody asked me to, to be a mentor and um, so I will say from personal experience, if you know somebody that you would like, like somebody that's already in your life, maybe in some way that you would want to take on that mentor role, then talk to them about it. And if you don't have that relationship yet and you, and, uh, you want to start that relationship, then do what you can through the means that you have to start the relationship. Um, but you know, I found it really flattering and, and kind of perplexing that this person asked me to be a mentor. Um, but it was, you know, that flattery was like, yes, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, it takes, it takes very little, uh, from, you know, from the mentor, like, uh, you know, I'm not really sacrificing that much to, to mentor. And, and so through this process, I kind of learned like, oh, I, I would like to do this myself. I would like to reach out to people and say like, hey, I would, I would love for you to mentor me in some way. I mean, I think mostly what I've ended up doing is, is tapping people for specific things because I think that they're very good at those things. Um, but yeah, I think you would be, you'd be surprised 
if you just flat out ask somebody to mentor you, um, they might they might surprise you in how much they respond in a very positive way to that uh, ask. Uh, hi. Uh, so sometimes, do you think in this pursuit of originality, people sometimes tend to become self obsessed with their own work and kind of put shutters on their eyes? And because uh, as a design student, I've always had problems with feedback. And the irony is, in a school like in every school, I mean, they tell you during projects to kind of put in everything you have while the project's given everything you have and you just given all you have while putting out the work. And at the time of the presentation, they just, when they kill your work, they ask you to kind of not associate yourself with the work. They're like, your work is not you. Yeah. So kind of don't get, don't get too egoistic about your work. I mean, how do you kind of balance it out when like, when they ask you to put all your emotions in the work at the same time and then ask you not to be like really attached <laughs> to your work. I mean, like that's something ironic. That I, that's something I've always yeah. faced a problem with. I, I think that's a good point. And I will tell you that I'm still dealing with that challenge. I, I think that I really don't, I don't buy for one second that nobody gets hurt when their idea is shot down. Like, it's, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe uh, you and I are unique, but I, I think, I think a lot of people get, can feel defeated because of that. I think it's, it's maybe more about how you deal with that defeat um, and how you deal with those emotions that will allow you, that can either hinder your progress or allow you to progress. Like, you know, maybe you need, maybe you need a good night's sleep to, to get reframe, to, to get back to that point of like, okay, like, let's think about that feedback. Like, was it valid? Like, was the can opener feedback valid? I remember, actually, this was the one time where I felt like I kind of dealt with feedback well, was that can opener comment. The guy said that, and I, I laughed because I was like, this is, I, I couldn't have imagined a worse response to, to that project. But, um, you know, I think we all are in some ways looking for, for validation that, that our efforts and our emotions and, our, and everything that went into this project were not for nothing. Um, but I think another thing you have to remember is that the feedback that you're getting and, and maybe the ideas that are coming out of it that are not yours. Um, and, and, you know, like you're, you're suddenly like, oh, I'm not the author of my own work anymore. I think you have to remember that the only way that those comments, that that feedback, that those ideas would have um, come to be were from the effort that you put in to, to establish the base layer for the work that you're doing. And so, you know, those comments, like those comments are made because, you know, I, I would think that teachers are looking for the opportunity for the, for the, um, yeah, for what the project could be. And they, they see it clearly now, but they wouldn't have been able to see it clearly then. And you've done, you've done all this work to get to that point. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's really difficult. It's one of the reasons I started I Draw on Receipts was to try and, and, uh, and not get married to my ideas as, to design, to draw something on on something disposable and just leave it, um, but it's still it's still a struggle. I think it is it is about how do you not maybe how you react in the moment, but how do you react overall? Like, do you eventually take that feedback and and make the project that that uh, that it could be that that it has the potential to be from the feedback or maybe you're like, you know what, that feedback's not right, but I know that I clearly there's something wrong with this. 
And so I need to come back to it and, and see what I can do. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if that was a co coherent answer, but it's definitely difficult. It's, it's, it's always, it's always emotional. It is, it is for me anyhow. Hey, James, Ryan Holman yeah. says hi. Hey, uh, I think, uh, I think I've just gotten the uh, request to wrap it up. Uh, if we've got one more question. I have a quick question. Yeah, what's you, up? You might have you might have mentioned this before, but um, have you ever instead of a company coming to you for freelance work, have you ever approached a company after seeing a opportunity for a product for them or some sort of I guess mm. product? Have you ever done that? And how how would you approach that? No? Yeah, well, I mean, there's so would you mean like licensing? Like you have a product and you'd like to license it to a company? Yeah, maybe. I, I, I never, like, I kind of, it's not as, I guess it's less, less uh, freelancing, more sort of entrepreneurial almost. But yeah, if, if you have, so you have an idea for a product and you kind of associate with a, a certain brand and you don't have the means to produce it on your own, would you say go to uh, Peloton, obviously, if, if they wanted some, some yeah. new product? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, Gosh, that's tough. I mean, I, I know the world of licensing a little bit. I've never gotten something licensed, but I've certainly submitted things for licensing. And, um, you know, uh, it is, I'm not sure. I'm not entirely sure. I think that's a really difficult question to answer. I mean, I think like, I think in order for a company like Peloton to take it really seriously, they would have to see considerable legwork done on the development. And, um, you know, so I think it's, it's something where, yeah, they're maybe not going to be receptive to just like a couple sketches. You know, I think for them, if you're trying to solve a, a real problem for them, it would have to be pretty well resolved and pretty airtight. Um, that's just at least my opinion, um, because, you know, you don't know what they have coming down the pipeline. They might already be, have solved this problem. And so it's, it's a difficult situation. And I think if you can, if you can get it to a point where it's like super, super locked down in terms of development, maybe it's worth it. Um, you might want to try and sneak some legal stuff in there somehow. Right. What if it's more of, say, a company that doesn't have a super strong focus on ID? Like, what if your main, like, value that you could bring is uh, ID? Yeah. And just, like, cold calling them and being like, hey, I've got a product for you or I've got an idea for an aesthetic or... Yeah, yeah. I think, again, like, those people they're probably inundated with something like they're not inter inundated with design, but they're inundated with something else. And I think especially for people who are not used to industrial design, you would still have to probably present them with something that is pretty airtight. That's where I think like, if you have, if you have an idea and you submit it to a blog or like, or whatever, like you, you get some attention to it outside of the company, then that can be, that could probably be really effective at getting their attention. Um, but I, yeah, I think uh, going to them directly, I just think, I don't know. I, I suppose it depends on the company and you could always give it a shot with something that you maybe are not as so precious about, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, try it out and tell me. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll go for it. I'll let you know how it goes. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I think that's all the questions. All right, well, uh, James, thank you so much for being a guest on Lens and for providing um, such rich insights. Um, this Lens session uh, 
uh, is being recorded and it will be uh, up on our website in the coming weeks. So thank you so much for everything. And thank you for everyone who's tuning in from pretty much around different time zones. I really appreciate you uh, and appreciate you being a part of this uh, experiment that we're putting together. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you for thanks, having Dr. me. And thank uh, you, James. yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Hope everyone is safe. Take care. Thanks, James. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, James.